Hi there and welcome to The Understudy. My name is Philippa and today we will read Memorization for Actors by Alexa Ispas. This reading is for my own educational purposes and it is an unedited version so if I make any mistakes just look over them. Introduction. Are you an actor who struggles to remember lines and finds the process of memorization frustrating? Or do you already have a relatively successful memorization process but would like to make it even better? Either way, this book is designed to help you learn your lines faster and more reliably than ever before. This is a bold claim, so let me explain why I feel confident making it. Although I have written this book specifically for actors, the strategies I will introduce you to do not come from the world of acting. They come from hundreds of research studies in FUS, in psychology. Over several decades, psychological studies into memory have provided a huge amount of insight into how memory works. This is the first book of its kind to adapt these insights to actors' memorization requirements. I believe that if actors were shown how to take advantage of psychological research into memory, they could memorize their lines quicker and more reliably than ever before. I am not an actress myself. My background is in psychology. and a subject I have studied to PhD level, level and absolutely adore. But I'm also a free spirit, and for years I pursued acting as an alternative career option. I eventually realized I didn't love acting enough to make it a lifelong occupation. However, during my foray into acting, I have witnessed firsthand the mistakes actor make, actors make while learning their lines. I also saw the huge amount of frustration, stress, and stage fright that come with not being entirely confident in, of knowing your lines. I am convinced that providing actors with a better understanding of how their memory works will resolve these problems. This book offers specific tools actors can use to learn their lines quicker and more reliably than their current standard. In addition, the book will introduce you to a highly effective memorization process. This process is based on solid psychological evidence of how to make the most of your memory capacity. Once established, this process will allow you to memorize more material than ever before, in less time, and with reliable results regardless of circumstances. By the time you finish this book, you will have a wide range of memorization strategies up your sleeve. You will also understand why they work and when to use each of them for a maximum effect. Understanding why particular strategies work will give you confidence that you are spending your memorization time productively. This certainly will make learning lines motivating and fun. Memorization will no longer be a chore and you must undertake or a, a chore you must undertake or a task you find frustrating due to not being able to rely on the results. Enjoying the process of memorization and trusting in its reliability will have many benefits to your acting career. You will need less time to prepare for auditions and therefore be able to take advantage of opportunities even if they come up at short notice. You will also feel more confident during auditions, allowing directors and members of the casting team to see the real you. Once you get the part, directors will love working with you because of well, how well prepared you will be. This will put you miles ahead of the competition and lead to more work opportunities further down the line. There is one caveat to all these benefits. You will have to put this memorization process into practice. If you are not willing to do that, this book won't be of any use to you and there's no point in buying it. If you are prepared to put, your, to put in your side of the bargain, I'm delighted to have you on board. I have kept this book short, so you can read it in an afternoon and have a detailed memorization process by the time you finish. The book will provide you with everything you need to know about how memory works and that is relevant to learning lines. Each chapter focuses on one specific aspect of memorization that is important to your final overall process. I have also provided a summary at the end of each chapter for a quick reminder of the key points. The final chapter brings everything together together into a step-by-step -step memorization process, so you can refer to it any time you get stuck. And now, without further ado, allow me to introduce you to the weird and wonderful features of your own memory. Chapter 1. The Complex Nature of Memory Short-Term and Long-Term Memory We generally talk about memory as if it was a single entity, 
However, all the available psychological evidence suggests that we refer to that what we refer to as memory is in fact made up of several systems and processes. Two memory systems are particularly relevant to the process of learning lines. I will refer to them as short-term memory and long-term memory. Each of these play a crucial role in memorization. Learning lines using short-term memory. Short-term memory holds those items in our mind that we need to perform the task at hand. As you are reading this text, you are using your short-term memory to remember the previous sentence, so the sentence you are reading at this moment makes sense. As this example illustrates, we use short-term memory consciously in daily life, often without realizing it. It is thanks to short-term memory that we can remember a telephone number long enough to dial it. Short-term memory has many uses while you are in the process of learning your lines. For example, it allows you to read a line of text and remember it long enough to say it without looking back at the text. This is an ability you may often use in the early stages of memorization. Short-term memory is also invaluable in certain types of additions. For example, you need, you need your short-term memory in situations when you are given your line just minutes before being asked to say it in front of the casting team or the camera. Actors who work for film or television often rely on their short-term memory when they are given their script the night before or on the morning of the audition or shoot. In such circumstances, there is no time to go through the full process of learning lines. Short-term memory helps you reproduce the lines without having them fully memorized. The reason short-term memory enables you to say the lines so soon after you have been exposed to them is that it keeps them immediately accessible. As long as the lines are held in your short-term memory, you can say them. You do not need the time-consuming process of storing the lines in the long-term memory. Even more astonishingly, short-term memory allows you to memorize words and lines even if you do not understand their meaning. Indeed, the ability to learn foreign languages rests on this feature of short-term memory. You can simply repeat a word or phrase you have just heard even before you know what it means. This is because, as studies have shown, short-term memory stores information using a so-called acoustic code. It encodes the information based on the sounds you hear. This makes it possible to reproduce your lines from short-term memory despite not understanding their meaning. The limitations of short-term memory. For all its amazing capabilities, short-term memory presents actors with some serious limitations when learning lines. One limitation is that, as the name suggests, it only holds the material for a short amount of time. This can be as little as a few seconds, unless the material is consciously repeated to keep it active. Actors are sometimes astounded at the speed with which they can learn a piece of text, only to realize minutes later that the lines have gone. You therefore need to be careful not to confuse holding the lines in short-term memory with actually having learned the lines. The neural connections that support short-term memory prioritize new information over existing information. This is why you can only hold lines in your short-term memory for a short amount of time. The material held in your short-term memory is unstable. How long you can keep material in your short-term memory depends on whether any new material displaces it. As long as you keep your lines at the forefront of your mind, you can remember them. However, as soon as you allow your attention to drift to something else, you risk forgetting the lines. Indeed, even having to say hello to the casting team or the director calling action can make you forget the lines if you are relying on your short-term memory alone. To memorize lines reliably, you need, to, you need your other memory system, long-term memory. Learning lines using long-term memory. For line learning, long-term memory is infinitely more reliable than short-term memory. This is because the material is maintained by more stable neutral connections in your brain, ideally suited for the task of holding information long-term. Once the lines are lodged in your long-term memory, they are, much, they are much less vulnerable to the effects of distractions or other external factors. However, before reaching this stage, two problems must be 
overcome. The first is that before lines can be embedded in your long-term memory, they must be processed by your short-term memory. However, this is not simply a matter of shifting the material from one container to another. Unlike short-term Unlike long-term memory, which has unlimited capacity, the capacity of short-term memory is extremely lim limited. As such, short-term memory works like a bottleneck. If you are not mindful of the restrictions imposed by this bottleneck, the liquid you are trying to pour into the bottle will spill. Memorizing your lines, whether short or long-term, therefore depends on the way you use your short-term memory capacity. The short-term memory is that while the lines are reliably stored in your long-term memory, your success in using them depends on how easily you can retrieve them. Oh, the second problem is that the viral lines, okay. To illustrate, there, here is a situation you have probably encountered in your daily life. Forgetting a familiar face just as you are about to introduce the person to someone else. In this case, the problem is not that the name was only stored in your short-term memory and is now gone. It is a familiar name. It is by definition logged, lodged into your long-term memory and is still safely stored away. Instead, the problem in this instance is that you are having trouble retrieving the name from your long-term memory. The same can happen with your lines. Fortunately for actors, there are solutions to both problems related to storing lines in long-term memory. This book will provide you with the understanding and specific tools to develop a bulletproof memorization process that overcomes these problems. This process will allow you to learn your lines quicker and more reliably than ever. Key points. Learning lines depends on two distinct memory systems, short-term memory and long-term memory. Each of these systems plays its part in a different way. Short-term memory provides immediate access to the material, but only allows you to memorize lines for a short amount of time. This system is also susceptible to distractions and has limited storage capacity. Long-term memory has unlimited capacity, but to make use of it, you must first transfer the material from short-term memory, which acts like a bottleneck. Once the material is stored in the long-term memory, you must also be able to easily retrieve the material. Learning lines depends on two factors. One, successfully transferring the lines from short-term into long-term memory. Two, being able to easily retrieve the lines from the long-term memory. Chapter two, dismantling the poor memory belief. A self-fulfilling self prophecy. Before we get into the nitty gritty of developing a memorization process, I want to address a common self-sabotaging belief. This is the belief held by some actors that their memory is not as good as everyone else's. During my acting days, I witnessed firsthand how debilitating it was when actors believed this about themselves. The problem with this belief is that it comes from a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe your memory is poor, your motivation for learning your lines is likely to be low. You may therefore put little time too little time and effort into learning your lines and you don't trust your memory. You may also postpone learning your lines until it's too late, adding an extra layer of stress onto an already stressful situation. The result is that you will turn up to auditions unprepared and your lack of confidence is likely to lead to a poor performance. Belief versus research evidence. If you happen to hold even a tiny shred of this belief, please allow me to provide reassurance. Your memory is just as good as everyone else's. In fact, unless you suffer for, from dementia or anything similar, there is no such thing as having poor memory. If you have read the first chapter, you will know that in order to store the lines in your long-term memory, you first have to hold them in your short-term memory. This is because the short-term memory acts like a bottleneck. The interesting thing in relation to the poor memory belief is that all adults have the same short-term memory capacity of around 7 items. This means that you can only hold around 7 items in your short-term memory at any one time. However, the good news is that your memory is just as good as that of any other actor out there. Even those actors who seem to rattle off reams at the text at the drop of a hat Yes, even those. I will show you in later chapters how that kind of memorization prowess is possible, despite the limitations short-term memory places on all of us. 
For now, I would like to convince you once and for all that there is no such thing as suffering from a poor memory. The more certain you become that your memory is just as good as anyone else's, the more motivated you will be to put serious effort into learning your lines. Let's take a closer look at the facts. The seven item limit. The seven item limit of short term memory is easily demonstrated through the memory span task. In this task, which you may have seen as a part of TME game shows, participants listen to a series of items. They must repeat these items in order after hearing them only once. Studies using the memory span task found that if the items are randomly chosen letters or digits, people can remember around seven items without any problem. However, when participants are presented with more than seven items, the number of mistakes sharpen, sharply increases. This seven item limit has been replicated across a wide number of studies involving many different people. For actors, this means that even those who appear to have phenomenal memories do not. The limited capacity of short-term memory is the big equalizer. This is good news if you think you suffer from having a poor memory. Any actor can achieve great memory feasts as long as they are prepared to put in the work and use an efficient memorization system, memorization system, such as the one outlined in this book. No matter what negative beliefs you may have held in the past about your memory, you have the potential to become an expert at learning your lines quickly and reliably. As we see in the next few chapters, what differentiates those whom we regard as having excellent memory from the rest is that they have is that they use a highly effective memorization process. This process allows them to make the most of the limitations imposed by their short-term memory. Key points. The poor memory belief is debilitating for actors and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, research evidence shows that all adults have the same short-term memory capacity of around seven items. The limited capacity of short-term memory is the big equalizer. Your memory is just as good as everyone else's. To make the most of your short-term memory capacity, you need an efficient memorization system. Chapter 3. Achieving Memorization Excellence The Mystery of Memory Genius in the previous chapter, we have seen evidence that, the, that, we have, that we all have the same short-term memory capacity of around seven items. But if this is the case, how is it possible for some people to achieve extraordinary memory feats with information that have just been presented to them? You have probably come across such sensational displays of short-term memory genius. Do these cases not contradict the seven item limit we just have discussed? They do not. As we will see, people who achieve such extraordinary memory feats do not rely on their short-term memory alone. They have found a clever way to, of, making us, of making use of their long-term memory. In this chapter, we will take a closer look at these people. Their memory accomplishments can teach us how to make the most of the seven-item limit of short-term memory. We will then apply this to the process of learning lines. The Memory Feats of Chess Experts one group of people who display extraordinary memory feats are expert chess players. For example, there are chess players who can play 10 simultaneous games blindfolded. How are they able to do this? If the chess players were holding all those chessboard configurations in short-term memory, they would fail. As already mentioned, short-term memory is susceptible to distractions. As such, if they relied on their short-term memory alone, the chess players would get continuously distracted and be unable to focus on their game. At the same time, it would take too long to transfer all the information into long-term storage to be able to play the game. Research examining this puzzle suggests that these expert chess players have developed, over their many years of playing, a special system. This system combines the best features of long-term and short-term memory. This allows the players to anchor the new chess configurations they are encountering to similar material that is already held in their long-term memory. Due to this anchoring to long-term 
long-term memory material, the new chess configurations can withstand the disruptions of shifting between different games. This allows the chess experts to make use of the new configurations as they require. As such, it is not that these chess players have a greater short-term memory capacity than everyone else. It is just that over time, they have developed the capacity to use their long-term memory faster. This allows them to remember new information by making it stick to information that is already available in their long-term memory. As we will see, this is something that is common to all displays of memory prowess, and it is particularly relevant to the process of learning lines. For now, I would like you to point out one other aspect of this research on chess players. Their extraordinary memory feats only apply to chess. Outside this area, they handle any memory task in the same width as the rest of us. This shows that in general, their memory is average. Their accomplishments when it comes to chess are based on their expertise, acquired over many years of practice. From average to great memory. What about ordinary people, including actors? Can someone who is not an expert in a particular field acquire the necessary memory skills used by experts? In the 1970s, a team of researchers began examining this question using the so-called digit span task. The task consists of listening to random digits, i.e. e.g. Um, for example, 71352, presented at a rate of 1 per second. After a delay of 20 seconds, the participants has to remember the entire sequence. If the recall is correct, the sequence gets increased by one digit. If the recall is incorrect, it gets decreased by one digit. The number of digits the participant is able to remember as part of this task is called their digit span. The study reported the extraordinary memory feats of Steve Falloon, a participant who began the study just like everyone else. His initial digital digit span was seven digits, as you would expect from having read about the limits of short-term memory. However, Falloon gradually became a virtuoso at recalling digits. By the end of the study, Falloon's digit span had reached an amazing 82 digits. It is worth illustrating just how extraordinary Steve Falloon's achievement was. Imagine that someone is reading to you the following series of numbers at a rate of one digit per second. 4, 9, 8, 3, 9, 8, 7, 4, 3, 5, 9, 8, 7, 6, 9, 9, 7, 3, 4, 8, 7, 6, 2, 3, 4, 8, 7, 6, 2, 3, 6, 1, 7, 6, 5, 1, 2, 9, 8, 2, 5, 9, 7, 3, 2, 9, 7, 8, 7, 6, 4, 3, 7, 6, 5, 1, 6, 7, 5, 3, 2, 1, 7, 6, 4, 2, 0, 4, 2, 3, 8, 7, 6, 3, 2, 8, 7, 6, 3, 2, 0, 8, 7, 8. Your task is to start reproducing the digits in the exact order in which they were presented, 20 seconds after the last digit was read out. You only hear the numbers once. How did Steve Falloon achieve this extraordinary feat of memory? The digit span is not like a chessboard. Unlike chess experts, he would not be able to apply board positions stored in long-term memory to help him maximize his short-term memory capacity. Nevertheless, here is where it gets interesting, and here and where we need to think about how this applies to learning lines. The study revealed that the method Steve Falloon developed bore a strong resemblance to the one used by the chess expert players. First of all, he worked hard and he set about his task patiently. He was only able to achieve 82 digits after devoting more than 250 hours to this task over many months. This consistent effort, just like the chess players, turned him into an expert at this particular task. Secondly, just like the expert chess players, Steve Falloon's system consisted of relating the digits in his short-term memory to knowledge that was available in his long-term memory. 
He was a successful track and cross-country runner and was therefore familiar with timed runs. He used this knowledge to remember the digits. For example, he recalled digits 4131 in the form of 4131, a time for running the mile. He also recalled the digits 9462 as 9 minutes 46.2 seconds, a time for running 2 miles. Similarly to the chess players, Stephen Lu's extraordinary short-term memory accomplishments was not based on an initial above-average memory capacity. As already mentioned, his initial digit span was only seven digits, just like everyone else's. His, su his success was based on using pre-existing knowledge available in his long-term memory to make the most of his short-term memory capacity. It is also important to mention that his extraordinary memory improvement when it came to digits did not transfer to anything else. For example, when he tested on random letters, his memory span task was 7, the same as for most people. What allowed him to perform so well to in the digit span task was the consistent effort applied to this task and the efficient memorization system he employed. Developing line learning expertise. There are a few important things we can learn from these studies of extraordinary memory feats. In particular, I would like to note a few similarities between the ex chess experts and Steve Loon, as these are things that we can also apply to learning lines. The first similarity is that neither the chess players nor Steve Loon possessed an above average memory in general. Their extraordinary memory feats were due to their consistent practice and their expertise in a particular area, rather than to above average natural abilities. This is worth emphasizing. You still need to put in the effort and the time to learn your lines, even with the best memorization process in the world. There are no shortcuts when it comes to learning your lines. The second similarity is that despite both the chess, the chess experts and Steve Falloon being required to remember new information quickly, they did not rely on their short-term memory alone. Instead, they both heavily involved their long-term memory. They used what they already knew to boost their short-term memory performance. Steve Falloon also used chunking, organizing individual items into bigger units, to increase the number of digits he could remember. Chunking is a powerful way of speeding up the memorization process and is easily transferable to learning lines. We will discuss the use of chunking in more depth in later chapter. Finally, both the ex chess experts and Steve Falloon had a powerful asset that allowed them to turn an average memory capacity into an extraordinary memorization machine. I am referring to the memorization process, without which all their hard work would have been far less effective. As you keep reading this book, you will gather a set of tools for your own memorization process. Key points. Studies of people who have accomplished extraordinary feats of memory can teach us how to overcome the limitations of short-term memory. These studies show that the extraordinary memory feats are not based on any remarkable memory ability. The memory achievements are due to developing the ability to use information stored in long-term memory to boost short-term memory performance. One of the studies also demonstrated the use of chunking, organization in organizing individual items into large units to increase the amount of material held in short-term memory. What differentiates those who we regard as having excellent memory from the rest is the process they use to make the most of their short-term memory limitations. Chapter 4. The Pitfalls of Line Learning Bad Memorization Habits in the previous chapter, we looked into studies of extraordinary memory accomplishments. These stu studies allowed us to distill a few important points that allow, apply to learning lines. However, learning lines is different from remembering chessboard configurations or memorizing digits like Steve Falloon. The good news is that learning lines is generally easier than the memorization task we considered in the previous chapter. One important way in which learning lines is easier is that the actors have the luxury of time. This applies even if they are only given the script a few hours before the audition or other type of performance. 
That is still more time than either the chess players or Steve Alun had as part of their memorization tasks. However, having time to learn lines is only an advantage if that time is spent productively. Many actors do not know how to make the best use of the time they have available. They do not have a carefully crafted memorization process to call upon, such as the one you will find in the final chapter of this book. Instead, actors generally rely on habits they developed in the early acting days. If they picked up good habits during that time, they may find memorization easy, despite not having consciously given it much thought. However, not all actors are so lucky. One bad habit to come some actors get into is to attempt to memorize their lines by absent-mindedly reading their script over and over. They do so in the hope that with enough repetition, they will eventually remember their lines. Intuitively, they sense that repetition enables the transition from short-term into long-term memory. However, absent-minded repetition presents actors with two big problems. The first problem is that this type of repetition does not lead to memorization. Studies have demonstrated that the futility of repeating material over and over without engaging in it. These studies have conclusively shown that if the repetition was done absent-mindedly, the length of time spent repeating the material provided little to no benefit for memorization. As such, how long you have spent reading your lines in an absent-minded way is not a good indication of how well you have memorized them. The second problem is that while absent-minded repetition is useless for the purpose of memorization, it does often lead to recognition. This means you are able to recognize your lines and know what comes next as long as you have the text in front of you. For example, you experience recognition when you start reading a book, only to realize you already know what comes next as you've read it before. However, recognition is not the same as memorization. To remember your lines through recognition, you only need to process them at a superficial level. You have the feeling of déjà vu as soon as you read them, leading to a false sense that you already know the text. Many actors who are in the habit of absent-mindedly reading their script over and over fall into the recognition trap. They think they have memorized their lines simply because they know what comes next while re-reading them. They do not realize that they have not even started the process of memorization and are shocked to find themselves unprepared when they enter the audition room. It is no wonder that so many actors find the process of memorization time-consuming and frustrating. This also explains why the poor memory belief is alive and well among actors, despite scientific evidence that everyone has the same memory capacity. How to repeat your lines during memorization If you want to learn your lines quickly and reliably, you will need to keep your brain actively engaged while you keep repeating them. Each time you actively engage with your lines, you are allowing the material to transfer from your short term to your long term memory. You are also making the lines easier to retrieve when it matters. What does actively engaging your lines mean? For one thing, it means not reading them from a script but rather trying to say them from memory as early as possible during the memorization process. In addition, there are many other things you can do to keep your brain actively engaged with your lines while memorizing them. Over the next few chapters, I will introduce you to a set of tools you can use to actively engage with your lines in a variety of different ways. Although we will discuss these tools one at a time, it is important to note that they work best when used in combination. Those actors who are deemed to have excellent memories use all of these tools, whether they are aware of it or not. Key points. Repetition plays a key part in memorization. However, not all kinds of repetition lead to successful memorization, even if you spend a long time working on your lines. Some actors have developed the bad habit of absent-mindedly reading their lines over and over for a script, hoping the lines will sink in through repetition. This absent-minded repetition of the material is ineffective, even if done for a long time. Actors who repeat their lines while still having the text in front of them can also be misled by the recognition trap. 
The recognition trap makes you think you know your lines simply because you know what comes next when you have the lines in front of you. To truly learn your lines, you need to keep your brain actively engaged with the text throughout the memorization process. You also need to be able to say your lines entirely from memory instead of looking at the lines and falling into the recognition trap. Chapter 5. Engaging with meaning. Meaning as memory anchor. The first and most, most obvious way to maintain active engagement with your lines as you repeat them is to focus on the meaning of the text. As you work through the meaning of the lines, you are connecting your new lines to material that is already in your long-term memory. By blending the new material with the old, you're making it easier to remember. In chapter 3, we saw how well this worked for the expert chess players and Steve Falloon. They all relied on blending new information with material stored in their long-term memory. You can start the process of exploring the meaning of the text by looking up unfamiliar words or phrases. Once this is done, you can go one step further and paraphrase the text for yourself. This will allow you to translate the text into your own words and thereby make the text meaningful to you. Just make sure that when it comes to memorizing, you learn the actual lines rather than your paraphrased version. Memorizing when there is no meaning. Focusing on meaning works great for a text that has meaning, but what about situations but what about situations where you must memorize nonsensical text or a text that appears nonsensical to you? For example, you may be faced with a script that contains long lists of words or numbers. Alternatively, the, or, alternatively, the text may contain a made-up language, or it may be in a language you do not speak. In such circumstances, there are alternative methods you can use. The best known way to remember long stretches of nonsensical material is the method of Loki, also called the memory palace. This method was used as far back as ancient Greece and is still popular today. The method consists of two steps. The first, the first step is to imagine a place with which you are familiar, such as your home or the street on which you live. The second step is to go through the list of words, numbers, or other pieces of nonsensical text needing memorization. As you go through this list, associate each item with something belonging to the location you selected. For example, you could use the pair. Uh, you could use you could pair the items to be memorized with objects within your home. In this way, the elements of your familiar location, your home, your street, or any other place you have selected, became a long-term memory anchor to which you can attach the nonsensical items. This weaving of old and new material makes the best new material, including the order in which it is to remember, easier to remember. Another way to deepen your engagement with non-meaningful material, which works particularly well for lists of words, is to create a memorable sentence. This will enable you to remember the first letter of each item you must memorize. Let's say you want to remember the colors of the rainbow red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. To do so, you could use the first letter of each to create a sentence such as Richard of York gave battle in Thane. Actors rarely have to memorize such lists of words as part of their script. However, it is a handy strategy for the next... It is a handy strategy for the few occasions where it does come up. Key points. The first way you can actively engage in a text as you repeat your lines is to understand its meaning. This includes translating the meaning for yourself through paraphrasing. This will help you connect the new lines to material you already hold in your long-term memory. When working with non-meaningful text, you can still relate the material to knowledge you already possess through alternative methods. You can use the method of Loki, pairing items with your text, within your text with those in familiar location, to make a memorable sentence out of the first letter of each item. Chapter 6. Organizing your text into chunks. The benefit of chunking. 
Organizing your text into chunk or chunking is another great way to maintain active engagement with your lines as you repeat them for the purpose of memorization. This is because, as you will see, the process of chunking forces you to keep organizing and reorganizing your lines in chunks of ever-increasing size. This constant reconfiguration makes it easy for your brain to stay engaged with the lines by keeping the chunks fresh and interesting. In addition, chunking has two further advantages. The first is that it speeds up your memorization process. Every time you reconfigure your chunks, you're building link, new links to your lines. As a consequence, you start seeing the results of your memorization efforts faster and can learn more lines in less time. An even bigger advantage is that due to these additional links in the, to the material, you are ensuring that you will remember your lines without drawing a blank. This will be particularly helpful in situations where you have to where you have to say the lines under pressure. Let's examine the process of chunking in more detail. How chunking works. Even though your short-term memory can only hold around seven items, what each of these items contains is up to you. The more material you can hold in each chunk, the more you will be able to hold in your short-term memory at any one time. You can then gradually transfer these chunks into your long-term memory. You are probably already using chunking in your day-to-day -day life without realizing it. For example, try to remember a phone number such as 0795127 You are likely to chunk it into 0795127266 or 0795127266 or any such combination that works for you. Chunking is therefore an extremely effective way of increasing the amount of material you can memorize and therefore speeding up your memorization process. The effectiveness of chunking was demonstrated, among others, through the previous mentioned study involving Steve Falloon. He used his experience as a long-distance runner, recoding groups of four digits as running, three for, uh, running times for various races. Effectively, Falun was using chunks to turn meaningless individual numbers into meaningful larger units of information. The ch use of chunking allowed Falun to turn his average short-term memory into an incredible memorization machine. As with this example shows, what counts as a chunk depends on your familiarity with the material to be memorized. For instance, someone having to memorize material that appears devoid of meaning, such as a Morse code, initially hears each dot and dash as a separate chunk. As a result, he, they only remember seven dots or dashes. However, the more familiar this person becomes with the sounds and their sequences, the more they will be able to organize the dots and dashes into letters. Once they can do that, they, have, they can deal with letters as chunks. Then, they will be able to organize the letters into words, which are still larger chunks, and eventually they can begin to hear and remember whole phrases. Studies show that anything can be memorized more effectively if it is divided up into seven or fewer chunks. Let's see how you can apply this principle to learning lines. The chunking process. Step 1. Divide your text into chunks. Begin by making all your lines, no matter how many they are, fit into seven chunks. Only use your lines for the purpose of chunking. Ignore the lines of the other actors for now. If the resulting chunks are too large to start memorizing, treat each of the chunks as a piece in itself and further divide this into seven smaller chunks. Keep dividing up the lines in sets of seven smaller and smaller chunks until the length of each chunk feels manageable to you. This is part of the reconfiguration process I was mentioning at the start of this chapter. Once each of your chunks is of manageable size, start memorizing the first chunk. Then move on to subsequent portions of, the next, of your text in the same manner. As these smaller seven chunk pieces can take hold in your long-term memory, they can gradually merge them together to form larger chunks. Eventually, you will be able to treat the whole text, no matter how long, as one giant seven chunk piece. You may be amazed at how easily this initially untamable monster rolls off your tongue whenever you choose to deliver it. Step two, choose a retrieval cue for each chunk. 
You have so far divided up your lines into chunks that are short enough for you to start memorizing and have made some progress toward memorizing these chunks. It is now time for the next stage of the process, gradually putting your chunks aside and trying to remember them from memory. How can you make this stage of the process as effective as possible? By setting up a so-called retrieval queue for each of your chunks. A retrieval queue is a memory, memorable word that works the same as a stage queue. When the retrieval queue is called, the actor, i.e. the chunk, steps in. A retrieval queue is therefore a shorthand version of the chunk to which it is attached. That works, what works well as a retrieval queue differs from person to person. Perhaps a word you stumble upon regularly in a particular chunk in is a perfect retrieval queue for that chunk. Once you remember that word, the rest of the chunk comes easily. Or perhaps you can choose the first word of that chunk as your cue. Retrieval cues can be a huge help in speeding up your memorization process. It is therefore worth experimenting with different cues to find out which are the most effective ones for you. Whichever word you choose as your retrieval cue for a chunk, the main point is that it should be memorable and meaningful to you. The more memorable the retrieval cue, the quicker you will be able to remember the chunk to which it relates. Choose seven retrieval cues, one for each chunk. Make a list of your retrieval cues on a separate piece of paper. As you, remember, as you attempt to remember the chunks from memory, see if you can rely on your retrieval cues instead of looking at your chunks. Eventually, you won't need the chunks anymore. You will only need to refer to your retrieval cues. Once you can say all the chunks with only the help of the retrieval cues, put the chunks away. Keep your list of retrieval cues close, but not too visible. Try seeing the text without looking at your retrieval cues. Only look at your retrieval cues when you get stuck. Make sure that if you change the size of your chunks as you make progress with learning lines, you remember to also change the retrieval cues relating to each chunk. By the end, you should have only seven chunks and seven retrieval cues, no matter how long the text. You should be able to memorize your chunks easily without needing to look at the retrieval cues. Key points. Chunking is a great tool to make the most of your short-term memory capacity. Divide any piece of text you want to memorize into ch seven chunks. If the chunks are too big, keep dividing each chunk until you, get up, until you end up with chunks of manageable size. You can then identify memorable words or retrieval cues to help you remember each chunk. As your memorization progresses, start combining small chunks into larger ones until you can fit your whole text into seven chunks. Chunking speeds up your memorization process as it keeps your brain actively engaged with the material. Organizing and reorganizing your chunks while, mem while memorizing also helps you access your lines without drawing a blank, even un when under pressure. Chapter 7. Building mem Multiple Memory Links Bullet-proofing your lines There's nothing worse for an actor than to draw a blank in front of an audience or a casting director. So far, in the previous two chapters, we have discussed how to set about learning your lines. We have started with the moment you first get your script to the point where you are able to say the lines from memory. We all hope that once the lines are in the long-term memory, we will be able to retrieve them when we need to. However, we all know of situations when this didn't happen. This is one of the difficulties we discussed in chapter 1. Actors not only have to store their lines in their long-term memory, they also have to be able to retrieve these lines on cue. How can you make sure that, having memorized your lines, you are able to remember them easily, no, mem no matter how stressful the situation? The solution is to build multiple memory links to your lines. The more memory links you set up, the more reliable you will the more reliably you will remember your lines, even when under stress. To some extent, if you have been following the process up to this point, you have already started setting up multiple memory links. You did this when you combined the two tools we have discussed so far, engaging with the meaning of the lines and dividing your text into chunks. The reason combining these two memorization tools is so effective is that they each provide different means of accessing the lines in your memory. The first tool, engaging with the meaning of the lines, allows you, to allows you to access them by attaching the lines to information you already know. In most cases, you can do that by making sure you understand the meaning of the text and paraphrasing it for yourself. 
Chunking, the second tool, allows you to access the lines through the way you have divided them up into chunks and retrieval cues you have set up. By using both tools rather than just one, you are effectively doubling your chances of accessing the material as and when you need it. Aside from combining these two memorization tools, you can set up even more memory links to your material. To do so, you need to set time aside to rehearse your lines in a variety of different ways. As a minimum, I advise that you write these line, your write, that you write your lines down, listen to your lines as a recording, and sing your lines. I also advise that you say your lines as you go about the day while introducing a variety of distractions. All the additional memory links you are building in these different ways will help you remember your lines regardless of circumstances. Let us briefly go through each of these possibilities in turn. Write the lines down. Writing your lines engages your brain differently than seeing them out loud, and therefore helps with creating additional memory links. If possible, I suggest you write your lines at the beginning as well as toward the end of your memorization process. At the beginning, seeing your lines in your own handwriting will add a visual memory element that will speed up your memorization process. In addition, writing your lines slows you down and forces you to notice every single word on its own. This is especially the case if you get stuck on a particular word or sentence. That word or sentence will stick out more prominently in your memory as a result, and you won't forget it next time. You may also want to write the lines toward the end, once you feel confident you are able to say them entirely from memory. Writing them out at that point will engage your brain in a different way. This will allow you to make sure all the lines are easily accessible and completely accurate in your memory. As you will be using your hand to write your lines, you will also add a useful muscle memory link that will help you retrieve the lines when needed. Record your lines. Recording your lines is a great addition to the memorization process. This will allow you to listen to your lines to listen to yourself saying your lines over and over. The more you listen to the recording, the more the lines will become securely embedded in your long-term memory. I suggest that you read your text while recording yourself instead of saying your lines from memory. That way, your recording will have a smooth flow and be completely free of hesitations. I also suggest making two recordings. The first recording, read your, neck, read your lines at a normal speed. For the second recording, read them at the breakneck speed. Listen to the recordings as many times as you can. As you get further into memorization, into, memorize, into memorizing the text, try to say your lines from memory at the same time as the recording. First, use the normal paced version, then move on to the fast paced one. Listening to the breakneck speed recording a few times every night before going to bed will help a great deal. You will notice the results the next day when picking up the piece again. By listening to the recording before going to bed, you are delegating the process of memorization to your subconscious. You are therefore making it easier to remember the lines when you have to say them under pressure. Sing your lines. Singing your lines may sound strange, but it gets your brain to engage with the material in a different way than before. As you start fitting your text around a melody, you are building additional memory links to the text. In addition, singing your lines as part of your memorization process presents another great advantage. When you repeat a piece of text over and over, it is natural to gradually develop a certain rhythm in the way you say the words. This will later become a problem when it comes to acting out the words. These patterns you have developed may keep you from responding authentically to what the other actors are doing. Singing your lines as part of your memorization process prevents this from happening. Having to fit the lines to a memory distracts you from the rhythms you may have developed while memorizing. It helps you to see the text in a fresh way, and it gives you freedom to be available to the truth of the moment as you start rehearsing with the other actors. I suggest you only start singing your lines toward the end of your memorization process, once the line are f lines are fully embedded in your long-term memory. I also advise that you sing your lines to different tunes, to keep things fresh and playful. Introduce distractions. Once you fully know your lines, introduce distractions while repeating them to yourself. Say your lines while riding a bike, doing press-ups, or any familiar physical activities. These distractions and the little things that ha happen while seeing your lines will help you build further memory links. 
For example, if you almost fell off your bike while saying a particularly tricky line, you will find it easier to remember that line in the future. Being able to say your lines with distractions will also give you confidence that you can deliver them no matter what is going on around you. All roads lead to Rome, as the saying goes. Imagine if you could create your so many memory links to your lines that you could remember them in an instant, regardless of circumstances. Key points. Setting up multiple memory links to your material entails memorizing your lines by using a variety of different mediums. Examples include writing your lines, recording and playing them back to yourself and singing the lines to a different tune. Once you fully know your lines, introduce a variety of physical activities as distractions. This will, be, this will not only set up further memory links to your material, but also give you the confidence that you can deliver your lines regardless of circumstances. Chapter 8. Contextual Factors for Memorization The important, Importance of Context in the previous chapters, you have learned a variety of tools to get lines securely embedded in your long-term memory. Once that part of the process is complete, it is time to introduce the vari vari variations in the context in which you rehearse your lines. The more variations in context you can introduce as part of your memorization process, the more confident you can be that you will remember your lines regardless of circumstances. In addition, with each variation in context, you will build even more memory links to the material. We will discuss varying the environment in which you memorize your lines, your physical activities, as well as the presence of others. You will also discuss how to memorize dialogue and how to deal with the context of the other actors' lines. Vary your memorization environment. One feature of memory that is that you is that as you start memorizing a piece of text, remembering it will be tied to your environment. For example, if you memorize your lines in your bedroom, you will initially only remember your lines if you are in your bedroom. This creates a problem for actors. It makes them think they know their lines because they can remember them easily in one environment. However, that is the only, if that is the only environment in which they have spoken their lines, they may draw a blank when delivering the lines in the audition room. Indeed, studies show that we remember something more easily in the environment in which we memorized it. In one study, scuba divers were asked to memorize a list of unrelated words either on a boat or underwater. They were later asked to remember the words in either the same or a different environment in which they had been memorizing. The results show that what was learned in the water was best recalled in the water and vice versa. You should therefore ensure that you are comfortable with your lines you start varying the environment and the circumstances in which you say them. This will prevent you from getting a mental block when you have to deliver the lines in a different environment. Alternative to, the varying, to varying the environment. In cases when you don't have enough time to vary the environment in which you learn your lines, there is a handy alternative. You may be able to mentally recreate the initial environment in your mind as you are seeing the lines in a different environment. In one study, participants were presented with a long list of words. A day later, they were brought back for an unexpected recall test that took place in either the same room or one that varied in size, furnishing, etc. The, partici the participants who were tested in the same location were considerably better at remembering the list of words than the partitions who were participants who were tested in a different room. However, a third group were also brought into the new room. This third group of participants were asked to think about the room in which they had originally learned the list. They were asked to think about what it looked like and felt like. The results showed that the third group performed no worse than the participants who were tested in the same room. This suggests that if you do not have the time to vary the memorization environment, you should attempt to recreate it in your mind as best you can while saying the lines. Vary your physical activities. We briefly discussed physical activities in the previous chapter. In that chapter, I suggested that one way to build memory links is to say your lines while doing a variety of physical activi activities as you go about your day. However, in this section, I would like to draw your attention to specific physical activities you may be doing while learning your lines without realizing that may get in the way. The problem with such physical activities is that your brain may come to associate them with saying the lines, in the same way that muscle memory works. 
For example, some actors enjoy pacing around the room while learning their lines. You may also find it easier to learn your lines with your eyes closed or while waving your hands in your air, or waving your hands around. If any of these sound familiar, this is something you need to take into account. If there is something wrong with doing these things while you are memorizing, if if there is nothing wrong with doing these things while you are memorizing, if this is helping you with the process. However, once you have learned your lines, make sure to you can say them without doing these things. For example, if you pace while learning your lines, make sure you can also say your lines while standing still. If you memorize while keeping your eyes closed, make sure you can say your lines with your eyes open. The same thing goes for waving your hands around or anything else that falls in this category. The easier your lines come to you when you are not doing habitual physical activities, the more certain you can be the more certain you can be you won't draw a blank when it matters most. The presence of others. One major contextual factor while saying your lines is the presence of others. As you start your saying, as you start saying your lines from memory, after the initial stages of the memorization are over, you are probably on your own. That is initially a good thing. You are still letting the lines sink into your long-term memory. The presence of others at that point would be an unhelpful distraction. However, it is important that you do not think you are done with your memorization process once you can say the lines to yourself. After you feel completely confident saying your lines, find friends and family who are willing to run lines with you. If you can, say your lines in front of several people, not just one person. People who are restless and unenthusiastic about your request for help are particularly good to have among your trial audience members. The less impacted you are by your audience's mood, the more confident you can be that you truly know your lines. Memorizing dialogue. In most cases, the lines you have to learn as an actor are part of a dialogue. If so, one important contextual factor are the lines of the other actors. When memorizing dialogue, I suggest you start by learning your own lines. Once you are able to say your lines completely from memory and do all the things suggested in the previous chapters, it is time to start taking into account the other lines that are part of the dialogue. To do so, record yourself saying all the lines, including those of the other actors. In case you are wondering, this is a separate recording to the one suggested in the previous chapter. In that initial recording, you will be only focusing on your own lines. The second recording is for you to become accustomed to hearing the lines of the other actors interspersed with your own lines as they are in the script. Listen to your recording as often as possible and say your lines when they come up, as if you were rehearsing with the other actor. This will help you, under this will help you get used to saying your own lines and hearing the other lines, the ones you don't have to say, before or after yours in the sequence. As a result, you won't be thrown off when you have to listen for the other actor's lines. Indeed, it would be best if you could make two recordings, one at normal speed, the other at breakneck speed. This means that if the other actor introduces, introduces a quicker pace while saying the lines, you are not thrown off. First, get used to the normal paced version, then move on to the fast paced one. Key points. In the initial stages of memorization, remembering is linked to the environment where you learned your lines. Once you say your lines from memory, start varying the environment in which you say them. If varying the environment isn't possible, you can mentally create the memorization environment while delivering your lines. Remember to also take into account the contextual factors. Consider your physical habits while memorizing. These may include pacing around the room, keeping your eyes closed, or waving your hands. Make sure you can remember your lines when you are not doing these things. Ask family and friends to run lines with you, to get used to saying your lines in front of others. To memorize dialogue, make recordings that include the other actor's lines. Varying the speed of the recording so you do not get thrown off if the other actor says their lines quicker than you are used to and forces you to speed up your delivery. Chapter 9. How to schedule your memorization sessions. The strategy of time. There is a close connection between remembering and time. 
As such, the way you schedule your memorization sessions plays an important part in how quickly you can learn your lines. If you have never considered this topic, you may not realize that you can make your line learning process dramatically more efficient by using time as your ally. This means you can spend less time learning your lines, yet remembering them better than ever before. To do so, you need to schedule your memorization sessions strategically. Before we get into the detail of scheduling your sessions, let us first examine an important aspect of memorization, forgetting. The forgetting curve. Studies show that forgetting follows a certain pattern, called the forgetting curve. This curve shows that we forget the most right after we have learned something. After this initial sharp decline in what we can remember, the curve becomes less steep and then levels off. If you are a stage actor and you have memorized an entire play, do not rely on the rehearsal period to learn your lines. Start memorizing some time before rehearsals begin. As you forget the most after you have just learned the material, what works best is if you can schedule your next session soon after the first. You can then gradually increase the time between subsequent sessions. Indeed, research shows that reviewing the material at irregular intervals increases your ability to remember it. Over time, less frequent review is needed. This has been, this has been termed the spacing effect. The more you take advantage of this effect, the more effective your memorization sessions will become. Using time as an ally. There are several other advantages of allowing time to elapse between memorization sessions. Spacing memorization sessions over a longer period allows you to focus on the material at different times and in different circumstances. This means you have the benefit of different, different things happening in your environment each time you memorize the material. You may learn your lines in the morning when the sun is shining and again at night when it is dark and cold. These different circumstances provide more triggers for you to remember your lines. For example, you may remember the ray of sunshine that hit you in the face just as you were saying a particular sentence. By contrast, when you condense your memorization sessions into a short amount of time, what happens is your, in your environment is likely to be similar with each repetition. As such, you cannot benefit from the added memory triggers. When you space out your memorization sessions, your brain also gets more opportunities to rehearse the material without your conscious awareness. By contrast, when you do your memorization sessions with a short period, within a short period, repeating the material over and over is likely to become boring. As such, your brain is likely to be less engaged every time you go through the material. You are therefore in danger of overestimating the extent to which you have learned the lines. Having to memorize over a short period is also often accompanied by stress, which by itself has a negative effect on your ability to memorize. Another advantage of spacing your memorization sessions over a longer period is due to the benefits of sleep on memory. While you sleep, your brain is processing the lines, transferring them from short-term to long-term memory. There are different explanations for why, sleep's help, why sleep helps and memorize, with memorization. One possibility is that when you are awake, you get bombarded with distractions. These interfere with the process of allowing the material to take hold in the long-term memory. However, during sleep, memories can be consolidated without any obstacles. Another explanation is that newly learned memories are reactivated, are reactivated during sleep. This leads to them becoming more reliably stored in long-term memory. Due to, the, due to the positive effect of the sleep, of sleep on memorization, two of the best times to schedule your memorization sessions are before you go to sleep and after you wake up. By rehearsing your lines before going to sleep, you are ensuring the subconscious part of your brain will keep processing the material while you are sleeping. Scheduling another session after waking up re-establishes the material at the forefront of your consciousness. Your refreshed brain can then access this material and keep processing it throughout the day. If you enjoy taking naps, you could build even more memorization sessions into your day. You could work your lines before and after each nap and gain an excellent excuse for napping as part of this arrangement. Memorization, memorizing under time pressure. There is a caveat to all this. If the time between when you get the script and when you must remember it is short, scheduling your memorization sessions close together works better. 
the brief amount of time does not allow you to fully transfer the material from short-term into long-term memory. However, it does keep the lines at the forefront of your mind. This ensures they remain accessible in the short term. As such, if you get your script the day before the audition, schedule your memorization sessions as close together as possible, especially near the the time of your audition slot. If you are forced to schedule your memorization sessions close together, here is a handy trick to keep your brain actively engaged despite the tedium of repetition. Reprint your lines in different fonts every time you attempt to learn them. One study demonstrated that changing the font in which repeated presentations of non-words were shown helped with the learning process. This was particularly the case when the material was presented at closely scheduled intervals. This is because, as already discussed, the more engaged you are with the material, the more in-depth you are likely to process it. In this case, changing the font forces participants to pay more attention when, they, when the text was presented in the same front than when the text was presented in the same front every time. In the same way, seeing your lines in a different font every time forces your brain to pay more attention. This will speed up your memorization process, which is particularly important when you have a tight deadline. Key points. There is a general trend of for how forgetting works. You tend to forget the most right after the initial memorization session. Then there is a gradual leveling off. If you have lots of time before you have to deliver your lines, it is best to schedule your initial memorization sessions close together, then gradually space them out. Spacing your memorization sessions also help, allows, you, allows you to take advantage of your subconscious consolidating your lines without any conscious efforts, especially during sleep. If you have learned your lines within the short time frame, it is best to schedule your memorization sessions close together. This will keep the lines at the forefront of your short-term memory. You can also print out your lines in different fonts for each session. This will help you pay closer attention while memorizing and keep your brain engaged with the lines all the way through. Chapter 10. Developing the right mindset. The fear factor. Your goals and beliefs as you memorize your lines are of crucial importance. Usually, actors see learning lines as a chore to be completed so they can get on with the fun stuff, acting. The motivation for learning lines is often fear. This most motivation is based on solid ground. If you do not learn your lines, you will not get the chance to show off your acting. Even worse, forgetting your lines in front of an acting in front of a casting director may damage your chances in the future. Why should they waste your time to call you in for an audition if they cannot be certain you will come fully prepared? Casting directors are notoriously short on time but have an exceedingly good memory for people. However, studies show that having fear as your primary motivation for completing a task is problematic. Let us briefly discuss why you should avoid using fear as a motivation. Extrinsic and in versus intrinsic motivation. Fear is a type of motivation psychologists call extrinsic. It comes from outside yourself. Extrinsic motivation works great for routine tasks which require minimal thinking or attention, such as sealing envelopes, factory work, or scanning items. As the task does not require thinking and is tedious and repetitive, it makes sense to use extrinsic motivators such as fear to get it done. You're more likely to put in your hours sealing envelopes if a supervisor is watching than if you were left to your own devices. Learning lines is a tedious repetitive task too, you may say. However, compared to sealing envelopes, it is more complex and requires far more brain power on your part. As such, your fear of embarrassment may only kick in when it is too late to give yourself enough time to prepare, rather than being there from the start. A far more effective way to motivate yourself to learn your lines is to use what psychologists call intrinsic motivation. This is a type of motivation that comes from within yourself. Instead of learning lines because you fear the wrath of the casting director or the audience, what, you learn, what if you learn your lines because the activity is fun and rewarding in itself? Learning lines? Fun? It can be if you frame it in a positive way. Making memorization fun. To make memorization fun, start with the attitude that you can learn your lines. If you hold a belief such as, my memory is poor, this is likely to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Instead, remember what you have learned toward the beginning of this book. All healthy adults are perfectly equipped to memorize about around seven items. 
unless you have dementia or anything similar, chances are your memory is absolutely fine. The more you get into the habit of learning lines, the more of an expert you will become at this task. This is the same as how Steve Falloon became an expert at memorizing lists of random digits through lots of practice. To motivate yourself to keep practicing, you can make memorizing lines fun. You can turn the process of memorization into something you enjoy instead of treating it as a means to an end. Don't just wait to get an audition to start learning lines. Make it a habit to learn monologues or scenes in your spare time. That way, learning lines for when the big day comes will not be daunting. You can make this fun by keeping a tally score on your wall of how many pieces you have learned in a set amount of time. Give yourself targets and turn it into a game. If you are a social if you are a sociable person, you may enjoy learning lines more if you post your progress on social media or if you ask a friend to help you. Get into the mindset that learning lines is f a fun activity that is rewarding in itself in and of itself, rather than a chore to be done to avoid embarrassment. The more fun and rewarding your memorization sessions are, the more likely you are to learn the lines well. You will no longer be tempted to spend the minimum amount of time on the task and then blame your poor memory for drying up in the auditions. Overall, learning your lines is like going to the gym. If you only go to the gym once in a while, you cannot prepare yourself to the guys with the big muscles. However, these people were once the same as you. They had to start from scratch and work their way up. If you wanted to emulate their success, you would probably start with some basic exercises first. You would also start going to the gym regularly and gradually increase the difficulty of your exercises. It is the same with learning lines. Trust that as you put the memorization process outlined in this book into practice, learning lines will gradually become easier and more fulfilling. Key points. Actors often rely on fear of embarrassment or similar kinds of extrinsic motivation to learn their lines. However, as memorization is a complete task, using intrinsic motivation, coming from the inside oneself, is more effective and fulfilling. You can enhance your intrinsic motivation from memorization through employing the highly effective, and therefore motivating, tools and suggest suggestions outlined in this book. You also need to challenge any negative beliefs you may hold about your memory capacity. Other intrinsically motivating factors include memorizing lines for its own sake, because it is a desirable skill to master rather than to achieve a particularly end, particular end result. You can also turn motivation you can also turn memorization into a fun activity, for example by keeping tally scores of your memorization goals. Effective and reliable memorization is a learnable skill and you will get better at it the more you practice. Chapter 11. A coherent memorization process. Take ownership of your process. Having gone through all the tools you can implement to learn your lines easier and faster, it is time to put together a coherent memorization process. This will allow you to see, at a glance, what approaching a piece of text might look like using the tools outlined in this book. Of course, you are a unique individual. As such, it is important that you take ownership of the memorization process you end up using for the long term. Only use my suggestions as a starting point for developing your own memorization process. Having said that, the next few sections will outline the broad steps you may wish to follow. Deepen your engagement with the text. Start by reading the piece two or three times, from beginning to end. Look up any unknown words or phrases. You may also want to paraphrase to yourself the meaning of a particular tricky passage. Make sure you memorize the actual lines rather than the paraphrased version. Organize your text into chunks. Divide the texts into segments that are short enough to you, for you to start memorizing one by one i.e. chunks, the material will be memorized. Remember, you are aiming for seven chunks. If the length of the piece means the initial chunks are too long to, use, to be used as a starting point, further divide each chunk into seven smaller ones. Keep doing this until the size of each chunk feels manageable to you. Take the first chunk. Read it through, out loud, once or twice. Make sure you understand what it means. Look up any unfamiliar words or phrases. Rehearse it several times until you can say it without looking at the text. Try writing it out from memory several times. Repeat this with each of the other chunks. 
Use retrieval cues to memorize your chunks. Identify a retrieval cue for each chunk. Try to pick retrieval cues that are memorable to you. Make a list of your retrieval cues. Put your page with the text next to you, but make sure it is not too easily visible. Next, put your list of retrieval cues in front of you. Try to say the text from memory while only looking at your retrieval cues. Did that work? If it didn't, go back to those chunks you had trouble with. Rehearse these chunks a few more times individually before returning to the text as a whole. Once you can say the entire text with only the help of the retrieval cues, put the text away. Keep your list of retrieval cues close, but not too visible. Try saying the text without looking at your retrieval cues. Whenever you get stuck, allow yourself to look at the retrieval cue. As your memorization process progresses, increase the size of your chunks. By the end, you should only have seven chunks and seven, seven retrieval cues, no matter how long the text. You should also be able to easily remember your chunks without needing to look at the retrieval cues. Establish multiple memory links to the, materi to the material. 1. Write the lines down. Do this while memorizing individual chunks as well as towards the end, after you feel complete with the extent to which you are memorized, to which you have memorized the whole piece. 2. Record yourself. Make two recordings of yourself reading the lines, one at a normal speed, the other at breakneck speed. Listen to the recordings as many times as you can. Gradually try to say the piece at the same time as the recording. First, go with the normal paced version, then move on to the fast paced one. Listening to the recording a few times before going to bed encourages your subconscious to continue the learning process while you sleep. You will notice the results the next day when picking up the piece again. 3. Sing your lines to yourself. Singing distracts you from rhythms you may have developed while memorizing. Change the tune regularly to keep the text fresh. 4. Introduce distractions while saying the lines. Once you know your lines, try saying them at breakneck speed. Also try saying them while doing a wide range of physical activities such as moving furniture, riding a bike, or doing press-ups. Do not attempt, do not assume you have finished your memorization until you are able to say the lines with, while doing something else at the same time. Consider contextual factors. Once you are confident you have memorized your lines, start varying the environment in which you can say them. Say the lines in a different room. Go for a walk while you're saying the lines. Mutter the lines to yourself while waiting for the bus. If you do not have enough time to vary the location, try to recreate the original context in your head before saying the lines in the audition room. Consider other contextual factors that were tied to the learning lines. If you memorized your lines while pacing around the room, make sure you can say them with just as much ease while standing still. Similarly, if you memorize the lines while being on your own, make sure you can easily deliver them in front of family and friends. When memorizing dialogues, initially only memorize your own lines, then make a recording of all the lines, including those of the other actors. This will help you get used to the hearing the other lines, the ones you don't have to say before or after yours in sequence. Turn time into your ally. For best results, give yourself as much time as possible for memorizing and space out your memorization sessions. If you can, start the memorization process as early as possible after being given your lines. This will allow your brain to process the material while you sleep. If you have the luxury of time, schedule your initial memorization sessions close together, then gradually space them out. If you have to learn your lines in a short amount of time, schedule your memorization sessions close together to keep the text at the forefront of your mind. In addition, print out your text using a different font for each memorization session. This will, help, this will keep your brain engaged with the material and allow you to make the most of your available time. Develop a positive mindset. Approach memorization with a can-do attitude. As you set about to start memorizing a new piece of text, challenge any negative beliefs you may have about your memorization abilities. You have the same short-term memory capacity of around seven items as everyone else, including people who appear to have an exceptional memory. You can memorize this text and easily remember it if you are prepared to put in the time it requires you to do so. In addition, unlike many actors, you now have a highly effective memorization process at your disposal, this book. All you have to do is show up and do the work. Conclusion. 
Congratulations! You now have all the tools to become a master at learning your lines. I hope the information and the suggestions you have gathered from this book will help you develop a bulletproof memorization process. As I have mentioned throughout this book, keeping your brain engaged with your lines amidst the tedium of repetition is key to how quickly and easily you can memorize. Therefore, it is essential to find ways to best keep yourself actively engaged. You are unique, and therefore, you have to make sure that the memorization process you use takes your uniqueness into account. I hope that the tools I have provided here will give you lots of ideas for what you might like to try. If anything I have suggested does not work for you, please ignore it. Just keep the suggestions that work. Thank you for sticking with me through this entire book. I look forward to seeing you take the acting world by storm. I would like to ask you a small favor. Reviews are the best way to spread the word about this book. If you have found this book helpful, it would mean a lot to me if you could leave a review. Even if you write only a sentence or two, it will help. Thank you. About the author. Alexa Ispas holds a PhD in psychology from the University of Edinburgh. Edinburgh. She developed a mem the memorization process outlined in this book while pursuing acting as a career after finishing her dramatic uh, academic studies. Eventually trained and worked as an energy healer and is currently writing books in her Energy Awareness series. If Energy Awareness interests you, feel free to check out Alexa's other books at www.alexaispas.com. Thank you for listening to my reading of Memorization for Actors by Alexa Ispas. If you are interested in a step-by-step -step PDF where it shows you all the steps that you can follow, click on the link in the description and it will take you to a PDF I have created for this purpose. Thank you!